Hey, yo. Back hey. again. How are you? Uh, I'm doing all right. How are you? What's up with your head, mate? Um, <laughs> yeah, a little bit, little bit of... Uh, yeah, a little bit of a souvenir from yesterday, but pretty good. <laughs> we can talk about that on another episode. Yeah, we'll talk in detail later on. But uh, I'm still, I'm. I think the consensus is I'm still reasonably handsome. Mm. And if you listen to the show, you probably would have saw the fight anyway. So. <laughs> yeah, probably actually, yeah. Nah, okay. yeah no surprises. <laughs> <laughs> so this week we got a guest. Might say, might not. I forget how this works again on YouTube. Like you know, if it goes in our faces, and when that someone else talks, you see him. But we'll introduce him anyway. So. He's the owner of um, Riddler's Gym in WA. He's also promoted for Epic Fights mm-hmm. promotions and um, yes. tra- trained like a multitude of great fighters that you know, competed like internationally and nationally uh, across Australia. So we have Darren the Riddler Reese. How are you today, sir? Hey, you going, guys? I'm good, thanks. <laughs> good to hear, mate. Cheers for, cheers for having me on. Hey, thanks for coming. Mm. Definitely. Pleasure. Yeah, pretty keen to get stuck into this chat, actually. Yeah. Cool. It's going to be a fun one. Yeah. So um, when we first get someone on there that hasn't been on the podcast before, so everyone that listens to us is on the same page and knows your background, so where you came from. So like, how did you start martial arts and how did you um, eventually like get into Muay Thai itself? Yeah, well, I started, uh, I started in Zendokai, actually, back in uh, 1989. Uh, so a long time ago, what's that, nearly 32 years. Um, and my instructor um, was, he was competing in uh, kickboxing, mod, mod tie back then. Uh, so a large part of our training uh, from very early on was geared around training that suited him as well. Um, he was involved in the classes. You know, the group was, I think I was one of his first five students uh, so, you know, it was largely, I think I was sparring for my first training session. Um, thin foam shin pads, 12 ounce gloves, just banging on, not knowing what I was doing. Um, but I was, I've been in competitive sports since I was, I don't know, six years old, I think, um, as a competitive swimmer, um, doing all the usual high school things, soccer, football, cricket, all those things. Uh, so highly competitive and, the uh, the competitive side of me, although I started wanting to learn a martial art, turned into wanting to test myself and compete, and you know went from a couple of um, semi contact uh, tournaments uh, to wanting to have my first fight. So after my uh, after my first fight wasn't really the direction that my instructor wanted to go surprisingly he was uh focused on wanting to build a a big school and so he he offered me to change to a gym that fight uh focused on you know fight training and training fighters so that was the that was the start so that that process took about 18 months Hmm. yeah so when you like you know started fighting from there and like you want to continue on like um it just hooked you straight away and uh like how about you uh, tell us a little bit more of your career and how how it, how it panned out well uh yeah it's sort of it hooked me straight away firstly the you know the martial arts training like it well, there was lots of uh, kickboxing and you know the early days of Muay Thai training which was more like sort of like I said before Mod Thai back then um, the clinch was pretty the clinch game was pretty rude and pretty crude and pretty uh, uneducated um, but it was certainly a start but it definitely got my interest in that um, and I was I was doing a belt system with the Zendo Kai still learning some learning some uh, some carters and training in gi 50 percent of the time um but yeah I, I definitely got that real focus for sparring and uh competitions and and then wanting to prepare to fight so um i think i went to thailand early early 90s um it was actually uh stefan remember stefan fox hmm. it was stefan fox who used to organize the thailand tours very heavily wmc uh I went on his first first tour to to Koh Samui, and that was my introduction to Thailand. 
So um, it, it went it went on from there. That was the journey. That was uh, the definite bug. Um, once you've been to Thailand that first time, all you want to do is get back there. <laughs> <laughs> how, how much time all up have you spent in Thailand kind of training and, and competing? Uh, I did... I did three years. I did three years straight uh, from late '97 to uh, sort of the beginning of of 2000. Um, plus, I did from that first trip in the early '90s. Every year, I tried to go for like at least two or three months, six months here, uh, three months there. You know, as long as you could afford to stay. Yeah. And overstay your visa. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it was that. And then I think in, like, 97, I went for the World Amateur Championships. I went for what was initially going to be the 10-day tournament. Um, and I came back three years later. That's a long <laughs> day tournament. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that, was a, that was a long stint. So, uh, yeah, that was, that was where I really submerged myself in it. Um, I went from... Um, it was the the King's Cup tournament, the the world the world championships, uh, which I I won that, um, and I got the the best boxer award for that tournament. And then from there, I just it was I went to one camp, but I didn't really like it. Um, and then Pon Marti from Perth, he was I knew he had a great a great friend and contact uh, Jatui in, in Bangkok. And so I got in contact with him and I, I went there and I uh, loved the place straight away. So it was very, it was very unaffected by, uh, by Western as it was a professional camp in Bangkok. Um, there'd only been a couple of Westerners been there before. So I was sort of like not accepted in straight away, but I was given great training. You know, I got pads every day and stuff like that, which back in back in those days, it sometimes took a long time to find your way into a camp and get their respect. Um, that was, you know, like I said, that was that was the early days of us Westerners going to going to Thailand. That was outside of Sipyatong in in Pattaya, where yeah. a lot of a lot of people went, including myself. My, my first long stint was uh, four months in. In Pattaya, that was in about 90, 93 or '94, I think, um, and that really got my really got my taste. But I was never really accepted there because they saw so many Westerners there. That was like the place that everyone was going to back then. That sort of took Westerners in. Um, my friend Damien Meyer had spent a number of years there, um, but I didn't really feel like I never really got looked after there. I got thrown into fights. So got given fights on the day and and stuff like that and the training was 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 certainly not the uh not in my best interest so um yeah after that i found i found the camp in bangkok St. morocot gym with jatui and uh the rest is basically history i hadn't i got assigned my own trainer and uh he really looked after me yeah it's good um so Looking back in career, is there um, a fight in particular that that really stands out to you that you remember? Uh, so many. Uh, I think I think actually winning winning the uh, the tournament at the World Championships, although it was a, a padded event, um, it was something that stands out in my mind because it was the first time that I really um, competed internationally, um, and it was. Uh, it was exciting in that I think I had I had seven fights over a nine day period, and that was quite the early days of the the IFMA tournaments. And so each fight was like five twos, um, and it was hot. It was at a place called Smut Smut Prakan, the crocodile farm, under a tin a tin roof during during the day. You know, arriving from winter in Perth into that it was like man it was like into the fire <laughs> uh, that that was that was one one really great and big memory and I shared that with uh, my good mate Brett Dalton and um, Luke Kempson um, Bruce McPhee preacher 
uh, guys like that were in the team. So it was a really, uh, it was a really great time. And the kind of thing where you get really strong bonds with with fighters, and it stays around for a long time. You know, um, other fights of significance um, for me personally uh, was. So many, actually, so many, but definitely fighting at Lumpany um, and fighting at probably my first fight. I had four fights at Roger Burn Stadium, probably my first fight at Roger, um, which was kind of like it was my first fight for Sang Morricot, and they kind of threw me in the, threw me in the deep end um, to, to sort of test me out. Um, like I, I paid for that first month of training and then I, I fought at, um, at Raja um, against a, a current uh, TV, TV fighter um, and I won that fight. And then after that, for the next three years, I never had to, I never had to pay for training again. So I was like accepted in the camp as, as one of theirs and really well looked after. So, yeah, there's, there's some pretty big things that stand out for me probably the main ones really yeah you, i'm always interested to get into like connie you mentioned um getting uh, wanting to move away from that, that more sort of um tourist cent or, or westerner rather centric yeah. camp and go getting into a, a proper thai camp where they kind of accepted you i'm always interested to hear of course um kind of 20 odd years ago it, the that that kind of accepting system didn't really exist where like you know everyone hops over to thailand now even people that are not even fighters like just muay thai fitness enthusiasts and and it doesn't really make yeah. uh, you know the gyms kind of have to accept westerners in a lot of ways like it doesn't really make economic sense for them to not have some westerners coming through so i guess i'm interested to hear like what yeah. was the process like for you when you're arriving at the camp and, you know, first kind of trying to kind of carve your place a little bit, well, what was it like as far as like how were you received? What was the training like initially? Like did you find you didn't get much time? Like what, what was that process like? The, oh, the, the training back then was was brutal. Like the time the time that I was there, uh, Sang Morakot was voted uh, like Thailand's best gym um, at three years I think three years in a row or during the time that I was um, training there um, and the, the training were like nighttime training. We would sometimes go out to like four hours. It was, they had, they had so many uh, champions um, back then and the, the, the gym was really, really well known. Um, so, but I found, you know, the boys were all friendly enough. There would be, there would be uh, the ones that want to speak to you a lot because they didn't know, you know, they didn't know English and they learnt a little bit at school and they wanted to try and practice it and learn and they took great interest in you. The fact that it was, there was a white guy that was doing Muay Thai and I didn't really need to be doing it for a living. Why am I doing it kind of deal? Um, and then there's others that, you know, never gave you the time of day, but that's just different personalities, isn't it? So. Um, the trainers, uh, you know, the trainer that looked after me was was brilliant. And same, it depended on the personality. You'd have trainers that gave you lots of time um, and then others that gave you not much time. So, like, everyone is different in gyms even now. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it, but it definitely took time. I, I found uh, and my belief was that I had to do what they did to get their respect. So I was yeah. doing you know, the, the 10, 12, 14K runs. I was doing the hundreds of knees on the bag. I was doing everything that I, I never tried to skip anything or miss anything. Sometimes that was uh, probably not the best thing when you're just kind of acclimatising and getting used to that sheer yeah. volume that we've never had in our lives. Um, I don't think I ever went into a fight where I wasn't overtrained and caned. Um, and just absolutely flogged because you just weren't used to that volume of training. You know what the what the Thai style training volume is like. Um, and but it was years later, uh, and even later in my time at Sang Morakot, where I was respected and with my trainer, we would start to taper. You know, Thais don't really taper their training at all. They smash five or six 
six rounds of pads right up until their final day of training and then they cut yeah. weight for two days. And then even then you see you see them go into fights and they they look tired, but their thinking is that he ran out of gas. We're going to do more. You yeah. need to do more. You need to run further. The, the train would get on scooters and make sure the boys were doing the runs properly and all that kind of thing. But I could simply see uh, that it was simply from being burnt out, being overtrained, stuff like that. Um, so I that was definitely something that I'm aware of as a trainer now. You know, I developed a really good tapering system um, and my guys are always fresh when they go into fights. They're never overtrained or caned, you know. Yeah, um, yeah, speaking of which, let's let's shift gears a little bit. And so going from your athletic career into now the gym, like going into the, when you became a gym owner and a coach. So, um, so when, when did that come about? When did it come uh, to start your own gym? Uh, well, that came around sort of uh, late, late in my career where I started thinking that, okay, I need to start thinking of the future. And, and so I just started doing a lot of planning, making notes, forward thinking, um, planning for the future. And then I just decided to do it. And it was while I was still fighting. Um, 2003, I started the gym and I just started with evening classes, uh, doing some classes, trying to get people in to come and train and stuff like that. And I had a small group of uh, of fighters, several of who came to train with me very early on um, because of, they heard about me opening the gym. Chris Tiger White um, was one of my uh, one of my day ones and came to train with me. So we had a group of about four or well, no, about five or six of us that trained together in the mornings. Everyone worked full time. So we, we trained, then they went to work and then I, I did classes in the evening time so and that just progressed to where it ended up very quickly i had guys doing my evening classes that wanted to fight and then it quickly developed into you know doing corners being a new trainer um and having to do the corner for three or four of of my guys and then getting myself ready for my own fight uh so that was that was very demanding and you never found your head was in the right place like i was holding pads right up until the final day of training and just my focus naturally shifted from myself and my preparation to caring more about, um, you know, my guys and their preparation, even though they were only doing three twos and smaller fights and I'd be main event or semi main event on a show and I would just be mentally sort of wiped out by the time I got to my own fight. Um, I felt like I wasn't, performing at the, the level physically I felt fine um, athletically I felt fine um, but mentally I just had flicked that switch um, to being a trainer and wanting to be a trainer more than I wanted to be my own fighter yeah so you mentioned um, you've touched on it kind of a, a little bit already like you talk about the way kind of like in Thailand there were certain processes like, like you know the way that they don't taper and you've developed um, an intelligent system of tapering for your fighters. So when you made that initial shift from, I guess you went from being a fighter to being a fighter trainer and then to being a trainer. When you initially yeah. started to train fighters, was it kind of just you took the model that you used to do in Thailand and kind of just did it with them and then you worked it from there? Or did you come into becoming a trainer like, right, this is how I'm going to do things differently uh, to how I was trained? Um, it's kind of changed. Some things have changed a little bit as obviously you learn more, um, you see more and see how our fighters respond to it. But in the early days of the gym, it was definitely what I found worked um, and how I had tapered things. So like as an example, on say fight week, um, you, you do five five rounds of pads, four rounds on Tuesday and three rounds on, on Wednesday. But I've even I've even tailored that more to being sort of like um, the last big one now being on 
um, the Friday night where we do where we do five rounds. So the week before the fight, the Saturday is like sort of like speed work. We do like forty second rounds and things like that, which kind of naturally starts that little bit of a taper. And then Monday would be four rounds, um, and then often Tuesday, Wednesday is is three rounds. So I've I've shifted things over time to be even even more tapered. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like yeah, that's a pretty smart approach. I guess it's like it's like myself coming from a strength and conditioning background. No, like it, it just makes sense to do it, even even for a sport, because like there's no point coming in like you know you can be really fit. On, and there's a saying in, in this in strength and conditioning like you know uh, <clears throat> fitness can be masked by fatigue. So you can be like yeah. you can, but if you if you, have, if you haven't if you haven't adapted, you haven't like you know no basically uh, taken away the fatigue that creates. From from the training then you, you can't show your fitness then when it when it counts yeah that's right yeah it definitely pays to be uh to be tapered you know because you know with the with the modern era um mma has had a lot to do with it the scientific approach um the way they look into things you know it's obviously and and sports science the way it's evolved you know there's been lots of testing done on on you know reducing volumes of training but maintaining intensity to yep. keep your fitness so doing less but still working that same intensity level but for shorter periods of time allows your body to recover um, and, and adapt so and I do that with my you know I'm very big on um, strength and conditioning and as well and try to try to incorporate it into my fighters training as, as much as I can and I, I I shift I shift that as around as well so with uh, increased rests and keep that intensity up and you know, we do a lot of things with the uh, assault bikes and uh, dead balls and farmers' carries and lots of explosive stuff, box jumps and burpees, that kind of stuff. But uh, you know, we tape all of that as well. So they've done their they've done their last bit of. Uh, we've got nine guys fighting next Saturday, and we've just done our last bit of uh, strength and conditioning training for them today um, at at the finish of our Muay Thai training. And so yeah, come serious taper time for them. Coming kind of back from that, like of course, uh, a lot of the time the real Thailand style traditionalists are not big on the strength and conditioning side of things. Um, when you yeah. kind of coming from that background of training in Thailand, was strength and conditioning something you implemented with your fighters from the get go, or is that something that you've kind of added in over the years? It's something that I added in. I wish that it was around when I was when I was doing it. Um, sort of like middle of middle of my career before I went to Thailand, I was doing a little bit of strength and conditioning, but it wasn't even so much conditioning. It was strength. It was like you know the the three sets of ten bench press, three yeah. sets of ten squats, um, some deadlifts and stuff like that. You know, um, but late later on. Or actually, more so after I finished fighting, I was looking for other hobbies for myself to do, and I, I you know, I heavily got into strength and conditioning. And so you, you learn, you learn these things, and you you get the benefit out of it yourself. Like I, I still hit hit pads and stuff every every week, um, and I just noticed uh, my increased athleticism so to speak, like increased fast twitch and my explosiveness and all that kind of thing. And I just I just wish that it was around when I was when I was uh training competing. Kaylee's the same. Um, you know, you would have seen she's very much into a crossfit and stuff yeah. like that. And she's as led now as as ever. Like no no slowing down whatsoever. So and I feel the same from strength and conditioning. And so I've naturally just um, included that into my fighters um, as much as we can workload wise. So, so when you do the strength and conditioning with your fighters and, and that yourself, it's uh, um, it's like the methodology. Is it is it from CrossFit or is it just from other other sources? Like, uh, yeah, how how do you work it in? Early earlier on, it was more so just uh, like general. Um, strength and conditioning stuff um have you heard of ross eminent yes yeah um yeah, boxing he's a boxing strength and conditioning guy in, in america and a lot of i used to do a lot of 
school old school stuff of, of his, um, which is just awesome, like a lot of sledgehammers and like uh, just dumbbell snatches and clean and jerks and, and all those kinds of things and, you know, a mountain of, of uh, burpees and things like that. And there was another guy over in Perth called Jay Gray who used to train and get a lot a lot from him. So, yeah, I just having had included that into my fighters. Um, obviously, myself, I've trained a lot in, in CrossFit as well the last couple of years and I, I do those kinds of workouts but I keep it more functional for my fighters I don't do big CrossFit workouts that are going to leave them sore I, I take some of the movements that are easy enough for them to, to learn um, and and do them into into workouts and I've kind of now sort of evolved back into um, a lot of uh a lot of still functional stuff as as well, you know. Like today, as an example, we did uh, we did two minute two minute rounds. One guy sprinted for thirty seconds on the assault bike. The other one was doing box box jumps during that thirty seconds, and then they would swap over. And they, so they did two swaps of that. And then the next time they would do you know assault bike or ski erg, and the other one was doing pull ups or burpees, etc., kettlebell swings, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Nice. Cool. So always, always sort, of, always sort of changing and evolving. And and I think um you make an interesting point there, like the always changing and evolving thing. Uh, because you are, like, I sing your praises on this show all the time. Uh, I'm a big fan. Like I, I really think of you as like a you know a, a Muay Thai genius is what I generally say. But I, I, I guess someone of your status is you have so much proven your ability to produce top tier fighters like you have about a million so is it for you um at this stage in your career i guess do you still make a point of kind of continuing to study especially in like kind of the strength conditioning fields and stuff like that like are you kind of uh i guess where do you source your information from are you always looking into new things or is that something that you just have kind of like a a particular contact that you work with on um in regards to you know, CrossFit and strength and conditioning. It really, it really comes from my own training and my own, my own desire to to work. Like I'm still as addicted to training as ever before. I still, you know, I still train six days a week, um, and so I learn those things from doing it myself. I know how it feels and things like that. You know, like uh, very, very popular and things that are being used a lot at the moment is uh, dead balls. Um, you know, you could use them dead ball cleans, dead ball throws, dead balls stacking them up on boxes, farmers carries or, or sorry, dead ball carries and things like that. And it, it crosses over straight into your clinch game. Yep. Um, I, I, I do things that I feel would be of benefit and sort of discover them myself and then pass them on to to my fighters. Um, but having, having said that, I... I don't. We don't do so much that it replaces our Muay Thai training. Yeah. Um, a, a large part of our success is that with our Muay Thai, I just, um, I just try to be smart. I really try to think about things, um, and we're very big on, we're very big on drills. Like even every night, every night that my fighters um, spar, even George Manns and Tyler Hardcastles do drills. Yeah, we do drill so that you each each week in my gym I have three or four focuses, um, like a curriculum, um, and we focus on those in the beginners and the intermediates classes, and we do them in the fighters as well. Because what what I teach my beginners and intermediates or through through the whole gym, what what my whole team teaches is real Muay Thai that trains people for competition. Uh, even though the majority of the people at the gym just train for fun and fitness. We're teaching them real Muay Thai. So we, we use those focuses and we take them into the, the fighters' the fighters training. You know, like this week, as an example, we've worked off of uh, we've worked off of strong covers. So everyone works, practices their strong cover and then countering off of that. Um, and we've worked on because uh, I've got I've got a number of guys having their very early fights, so they're fighting with shin pads on. So catching and sweeping is very successful. So this week in the gym, we've we've all been doing catching and sweeping and you know, worked some different types of sweeps. So 
and you practice that, whether you're George Mann, Tyler Hardcastle, or a beginner in my class that's been training for a month. Um, and a lot of people, you know, it adds to your skill set. Yeah. Adds to your skill set, definitely. Focuses each week, and then we bring it in, bring it into their game, and re- refresh them, remind them, practice it, and then use it in sparring, then spar with it, you know? Yeah, I, I really like that that philosophy. Um, to, to kind of like get into it, so what you mentioned there is that you talking about you know even in just like kind of one sentence where you got guys having kind of their first and their early fights and then you got like guys like tyler and george in one championships and, and you just have so 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 many fighters like at any given time like we have to be the busiest fight gym in australia like i don't think any other gym has as many fights as Ridley's, right yeah. and then yeah. so to kind of tie back to what we were already um speaking about is like you know you've got you know quite a regimen to plan as far as tapering guys down for their fights like what's the i guess like the organization like like are you, are you just keeping just like a massive folder of where everyone's at with their fight preps is it you know like it, it just seems like such a logistical like an organizational challenge uh, well what's yeah. what's that the back end kind of work like managing a fight team that big even just yeah. with, just the training the size, the size of the team and the way it has grown um, it, yeah, it, occupy, it does occupy a lot of a lot of my time. I've got a, you know, I've got I'm lucky, and I've got a really great team. Have really developed a great team um, that that physically help a lot. Um, and when I've got a lot going on with fights and fight shows, I sometimes do less in my classes so that I can do more with the fighters or plan more for them. Um, but you know, obviously. Before before COVID, there would be sometimes we would just have an insane amount of fight preps going on, sometimes three or four different fight camps going on at the same time and in different stages. But, um, you know, we basically have our guys that are in very what we would call our fight camp. I'm very big on having my guys train regularly. Yeah. Um, I'm not one of these trainers that lets their guys come in or take lots of time off and then come back into the gym with low condition and train for a couple of weeks and say oh hey can you get me a fight I'm like you've got to be in the gym so I'm I'm very big on that because most people are only going to compete for a few years so I really try and encourage my guys to stay in the gym as much as I can Um, and then go go from there Um, what we call our fight camp is what I call power phase, which is three weeks before the camp. So everyone is already onto their nutrition, already got great conditioning from training, say four to five times per week. Um, and then we uh, we hit the power phase, what I call power phase. The first week is a little bit of a jump up from normal maintenance training yeah. and then hour week and then taper week. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's it's really good. <laughs> Love talking shop. Yeah, <laughs> it's good. <laughs> the other question that is always interesting to me, as someone who has so many fighters, is that like, I I guess like, how do you? Oh, I suppose what goes into, of course, like if you were working directly, as in holding the pads and stuff like that, for everyone that had a fight coming up, this wouldn't be enough right. hour in the day. So I guess like a lot of the time you will hear kind of people. Uh, you know, complain that say their trainer doesn't hold pads for them or something like that. But once you've got a certain number of fighters, you you, you can't have that Thailand style of training essentially, right? So like, I guess uh, what goes into building, you know, are your guys just holding pads for each other? Um, what yep. goes into kind of building a gym sort of ecosystem where the guys can bring each other up and it doesn't rely on that one-to-one trainer fighter? Yeah, that's right. Well, um developing an ego system too so to speak like you know even guys I I make it clear that everyone knows and obviously anyone that's been in the team for any amount of time um, knows that when their fight is getting closer they're on pads with us every day you know Um, and I find people are still learning and still improving because they're in the gym and they're, they're following what we teach you know the, the the drilling and the, the skills 
um, carries over because they've drilled it, carries over into their sparring. So they're still learning things, you know, and my, my, myself um, and my other trainers, Dan, Dan Skinner, uh, one of my uh, one of my ex fighters, Dylan Olson, um, Lloyd Dean. Um, you know, we're we're moving we're moving around and we're watching everyone equally, giving them pointers for their their sparring, um, giving them pointers with their clinching. Sometimes joining in with clinch stuff like that. Yeah. So uh, everyone continues to learn, um, and I have I have a saying within the team. You know, iron sharpens iron. So. I always encourage the more experienced guys to, you know, when they don't have a fight on, to work with someone less experienced so they can they can pass on what they've been taught um, by the more experienced guys, you, you know, um, and myself or learn themselves from fight, pass that on because then that person gets better, which gives them more challenging competition in sparring or clinching. So then everyone raises one another up and that's that's – the big uh that's the big theme through my team hmm. and it kind of ties in i guess um do you think to like when you say you want guys in the gym all the time you don't want them to have their fight and disappear uh, a lot of what that can come down to is like if you've had your fight even if you're not getting right back to getting stuck into hard training you can just be a presence in the gym and just kind of serve, right. serve as someone who can help you, especially with like you need all hands on deck with the amount of fights that you guys have. So are your guys generally after their fights, they're back in chucking the pads on and helping, you know, the next crop get ready? Look, not, not so much straight away. You know, I, I make sure uh, I make sure that they, they have a week off, you know, a week. Most of them want to be back in the gym like a couple, of t- a couple of days later, but I'm like, look, just take the week. Just enjoy real life, miss training, want to want to come back here so you get an appreciation for being in the gym, uh, getting home late every night, um, you know, eating a late dinner, going to bed late, waking up early for work and leaving the life that you did, you know, you'll appreciate it, appreciate it more um, by, by having that week off, freshen up, yeah. um, you know, and then I say to them, you know, you don't have to be back in the gym every night. Try and keep a routine, you know, three, say three days in the week or come back and, you know, don't spar because you might have injuries that need healing or, um, you know, double up on someone clinching who does have a fight so you can work them but you're getting the rest without the intensity, just stuff like that. Yeah. Encourage them to do three rounds on the pads instead of being back to four or five, just those kinds of things, yeah. And you think kind of like it, it, it can be a little bit of a um – uh, an undervalued thing is actually staying on the way that guys come back. Because I know for myself personally, like I've really done myself no favors getting straight back in the gym and training hard yeah. the Monday after a fight, yeah. like dozens of times. Like, do you think that's something that, like, because there's that matter of like when you get back in the gym, but you make the, the, the great point that, that you can be back in the gym without driving everything back up to 100 straight yeah. away, just creating that kind of like bal- a little bit of balance. Yeah. It's definitely important to have that balance and not to be not to be overdone, you know, mentally, mentally and physically, physically yeah. as well. You know, you've, your body, you put your body through the ringer, in, you know, in a in a fight camp, um, training really hard, preparing for it mentally as well, trying to you know selling tickets, preparing yourself mentally for the fight, cutting weight, um, you know, and then of course the fight where you take physical damage, and you, you should. You should give yourself some rewards after that with it being, you know, at least a few days off and going to eat a little bit of crap food um, and just, you know, rewarding rewarding yourself with a little bit of normal normal life. I, I find small rewards helps you be more disciplined, you know, for longer rather than, you know, rather than burning yourself out. Perhaps, you know, if you do that, you'll stay in the sport 10 years instead of five years stuff like that because you won't get the shits with always being in the gym after a while, which if you feel like that, then you're not enjoying it anymore. Yeah, sustainability is key, I guess. Like uh, I think yeah. you see a lot, like especially like you know, kind of young, hungry fighters, they don't even really realise that they're doing it, but they're actually training in a way that they just hit a point where they go, I actually don't like this anymore. Like it's taken my whole life. I've never had any time to do this, I've fallen behind on my work. And like I just – 
don't want anything to do with it anymore. Even though, you know, the reason they were doing it so hard is because they loved it so much. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I, I, I quite often have team meetings um, and I, I often have my fighters, you know, write down goals, short-term goals, mid-term goals, long-term goals, career goals, you know, and, uh, you know, when I talk to them about it, it's um, particularly about uh, training regularly and becoming the best that you can be. Um, and the fact that the age that they are, you know, I explain to them that this is this is the sport in your athletic peak that you've decided to dedicate yourself to. So you want to be the best that you can be. So later on in life, when you're if you're forty and fifty and sixty, you don't look back and go, "Damn, I wish I hadn't have been so damn slack," or "Fuck, I was talented. Why the hell didn't I use that?" You know. Because uh, I've, I've, you know, over the years that I've been a trainer, I've, I've seen some incredible talent that has been wasted, and obviously some some talent that hasn't been wasted. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's um, yeah, it's just crazy. Men, the mental aspect of it, which kind of goes into like a question or, or like a topic I wanted to delve into, because I I listened to uh, your interview on um, Moita interviews. Great podcast. Go listen to that one. Um, with you and Peasy talk about the mental aspect yep. of training, which I, I don't feel is like talked about enough for a lot of my coaches as well from there. So yeah. what are the, some of the like, procedures that you put in place with fighters to get them mentally ready to fight and like, you know, be properly aroused for the night of the fight as well that they're going to peak yeah. performance? Uh, look, I'm not, I'm not big on um, mentally arousing them prior to the fight. I think, that happens naturally. I think the most important thing and a large part of the reason why my fighters don't look like they, they gas or get tired is because we control that adrenaline. We don't let anyone get overwarmed up, overhyped, um, not too pumped up. I mean, I know everyone's a little bit different, but if you can control that adrenaline rush before the fight and during the fight, it's one of the large reasons why I stay really calm. Um, it can make a, a massive difference. But during during fights, you know, fight prep and and leading up to fights with trainers, uh, with, with the fighters, I talk to them about um, and teach them about learning to visualise, um, you know, doing a little bit of meditation or relaxation, um, you know, with there being lots on YouTube and things like that, putting themselves into a relaxed state. Uh, and then learning to learn to visualize and see themselves doing the things that we work with them on pads. You know, like we've got we've sort of like got our gym style of things that we work and emphasize a lot across the board that I know work in fights. Um, but then we also have specific weapons for each fighter that is particular to their style, things that they're naturally good at, or their body type and build. Um, and so I, I say to them uh, about visualising and seeing themselves doing those things uh, in the fight, you know, landing them successfully. Um, I, I get them to see themselves visualise being calm before the fight, um, being up in the ring and how they're feeling and controlling their breath and feeling strong and fit and ready and those, those kinds of things. Um, I I also mentioned them to to them to to visualize um, getting hurt and dealing dealing with that. How they want to practice recovering from that, you know, working on strong cover, or move moving off, and, and little things like that, you know, which can help them them deal deal with it. Not just focused on winning and seeing their hand raised, um, but focusing on the performance that results in that you know that hand being raised or the, that that belt or or something like that you know if anyone's fighting for a title I, I say to them not not to focus or think about winning the belt and and stuff like that but actually your performance that's going to get you that belt it's yeah i really like that approach you're saying they're like you know just even think about every aspect of the fight even if you get hurt you have to visualize that and just be able to work through it yourself and i think that's really smart um so that has there 
been instances with fighters that you kind of have to pull them out of a negative space, like with their training or in, when they're in a fight itself or before a fight? Um, or, you know, I think you, you always come across, you know, everyone's got different personalities. Some people are, some people are, are negative thinkers and, um, or, or, you know, worry or, or stress a lot. But I think my team, I think with my team, we've always got, we've always got a number of people that they're sharing the joint journey with. And I think they take great comfort in that, that, that they're all going that they're all going through it, you know. I'll, I'll sometimes, I'll sometimes hear someone else will tell me that oh, such and such is really struggling. He's nervous about this because they feel too nervous to come to me to talk about it. Um, so then I'll approach them about it and speak to them. Um, but often, you know, I'll, I'll try and touch base with each person to give them a sort of that opportunity where something like that might come up that they could they could suggest it or talk about it or. You know, same same physically. If I can see that someone's looking a little bit under the weather, or you know, I'll ask them what they've eaten that day and how much water they've drunk and that kind of thing. And it's often those kinds of things that affects the the, the specific training session. So then we can change that. So or or talk them. You know, if they're having doubts about something, then talk them around that and show them the other side of thinking positively and th- and through that. To help them deal with it. Yeah, that's, that's good. Like <clears throat> going to your approach, which seems a very holistic approach in terms of like you know just covering every aspect as well. You, you talk about the nutrition side as well. Is is that something that you help your fighters with a fair bit? I yeah. Look, I I'm certainly not a nutrition expert, and uh, I I don't try to try to preach that, but. I know from my years of experience the kinds of foods that you should be eating. Um, if anyone wants very specific um, nutrition plans and stuff like that, I, I I have a couple of couple of people that uh, we have worked closely with for a number of years, um, and I, I put them onto them if they're looking for you know to really bring their weight down and, and stuff like that. But I'm very good at general general training health, you know, eating whole meals and I teach them about eating, eating brown rice and uh, oats and, and, you know, good, good solid carbs to fuel their training sessions, um, making sure that they're eating enough times throughout the day, not bigger gaps. Um, I suggest to them pre-training snacks, um, kind of meals that they should have when they get home and things like that without it being a specific plan but just trying to share with them knowledge um, to add to their to their repertoire um, and I'm also learning a lot about obviously I know cutting weight um, and did it a lot myself um, but I've found that that has um, evolved totally and, and that is probably the main thing that I'm learning about and evolving constantly now from all the the, uh, the, the stuff that's out there um, and I've made made a lot of a lot of changes and a lot of gains to the weight cutting process and you know water loading the water loading process and the types of foods you know switching to low fiber and uh, and all those kinds of things so yeah i've learned a lot about that as well but i'm certainly not an expert just <laughs> experienced in it <laughs> Sometimes you just you just got to set them on a certain path. So like, just go look. You just got to try these couple of things out, and like, you know, you probably find some good benefit in it, out of it. And the stuff you say yeah. sounds good. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, like you know, with with newer fighters, with newer fighters, they're easy. You know, it's they're they're sort of newer to sport unless they've been a dedicated athlete in something else. Um, most of them make the same common mistakes. I'll I'll sit them down and ask them tell me what they've eaten for that week and give me a plan. And probably one of the main corrections is two biggest spaces between their meals. You know, they have breakfast, they have lunch, and then they have dinner and nothing in between. And they'll go from eating lunch at 12 o'clock to not having anything to eat until 9.30 at night when they get home from training. So and those, those kinds of things affect their training. So that I, I teach them about adding in extra meals and, you know, having a bigger breakfast and something prior to training, which is very important for the how they get through the training session, especially if they've had, you know, all my guys, all my guys work full time. Um, 
So they've, they've you know, they've been on on the job for six or seven or eight hours prior to coming training. So they're incredibly dedicated. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Um, I'm going to ask a question that was sent through the Instagram here from um, yep. one of your own fighters, Danny. <laughs> <Senator>. <laughs> What is she setting me up for? <laughs> uh, she asked, like, uh, how does Darren deal uh, um, deal and train different personalities, uh, also females and, and, and between females and males? That's since, a good question. Since, I have a, since you have a pretty big uh, female team. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, yeah, everyone I – treat, I treat my fighters and speak to them how I would want to be, you know, I'm friends, I'm friends with them. Um, I try not to ever talk, well, I'm not try to, I never talk down to my fighters. You know, you're sort of like on, on the level and they, they respect you for that. They respect you as being their trainer already. And I think that helps maintain it um, by, by treating them as a, as a normal person, um, speaking to them as a friend, but that you're just guiding them through the process. Um, Everyone can be, especially in the lead up to fights and during fights, can need to be spoken to a little bit different. You know, everyone's a little bit different. Some people do like to or need to be revved up a little bit more. Others need to be calmed down and and like a calm voice, whereas I've had some fighters that will say to me, look, can you try and hype me up a little bit more or speak to me harder between rounds or something like that, you know? Um, in that competitive kind of uh, side of things. In regards to the differences between males and females, obviously I've had a strong history of and long history of training um, females and with Kaylee being my wife, uh, obviously learning a lot about training females, um, the, the stages of the cycle and how it can affect how it can affect their training. Um, being being aware of those things, you know what I mean, um, and being able to speak to them about that, it not being like a something that you you can't talk to them about. Um, so they feel, I guess, they feel like if they're having an off session or an off couple of days because they're getting their period or, or whatever it may be, that you're aware of that, you know, and you you with that, you know. And I've had, you know, I've had female fighters on pads in power phase bawling their eyes out on pads but they're actually okay they're just crying because of hormones yeah. and it's not their fault and they're not in control of it so you just have to you just have to roll with it you know you don't have to treat them any differently but just be aware of it and respectful uh, no. that's cool mm-hmm. Um, I, one thing I was also interested to ask is, of course, um, as we touched upon, um, George and Tyler have gone over to one championship, which brings with it, you know, uh, you have so much experience in, um, you know, the the traditional, the true Muay Thai format, but one championship did kind of spin things around a little bit, right? Like, so you've got the, the four ounce MMA yeah. and you've got the weight cutting protocols a bit different as well. So I guess um, for you, what was that pro? process like is starting to kind of adapt to that that different format to take the guys overseas to one uh it was it certainly put a it put a spark in things you know working with the working for and preparing for the little gloves um obviously it changes your defense and the kinds of tactics that you work it even it sort of changes the style a lot guys tend to be, um, you know, instead of kicking as much, uh, tend to be starting with the hands, you know, like really leaping in with the idea that if they land those, you know, those power punches, it's game over. And we found, you know, with the one championship style, even guys were taking the kicks to step in and land the punches with those little gloves because, you know, those those little gloves are a game changer and yeah. you land one, two shots of those and it's like, it's kind of like the guys say it's like a bomb, like a lightning bolt bomb in your in your head and it's just kind of, it can be like you just see these stars or it can be can be lights lights out with it, you know, and then you're okay again afterwards. It's Yeah, it's really weird. So, yes, it changed the, the, 
the preparation uh, quite a bit, the way you had to cover, the way the things that you threw. Um, and in terms of the weight cutting pro process um, and the way you, you, you bring your weight down but stay hydrated to pass the hydration tests but make weight is mind-blowing. <laughs> it, it's mind-blowing. Um, it took us a couple of it took us a couple of goes. Um, Tyler had a failed attempt, which was a, a massive learning curve, and it was it was a massive, massive experience um, that required a lot of a, a lot of learning and a lot of evolution to get it right. Um, because both George and Tyler, when they fought uh, in in one championship, were on the upper side of their weight division, so they had quite big weight cuts. Yeah. Um, so very difficult early on to get it right that they brought their weight down but stayed hydrated enough to pass the hydration test to then jump on the scales and make weight. Yeah, and so where can you kind it's, of go for that kind of advice? It's hectic to understand. Uh, basically, it's just trial and error. Um, yeah, well, George, uh, nutrition wise, George got great help from the fight dietitian that's doing a lot of the the UFC MMA guys. Um, he's fantastic with his with his food. Um, the hydration levels and stuff like that, we kind of had to some trial and error um, and also just help help from guys that have been there and, and done it. You know, we shared time with Isaac Miller um, that was very forthcoming with his things that he, he learnt. Um, and, you know, there's, there's basically a, a little bit of trickery to passing the hydration tests. Um, to to pass the hydration, but then step on the scales. Um, very very hard on the bodies, but for, for those guys with with cutting the weight and having to do it a couple of times in a day. Although they say the hydration tests make it safer, it is for the guys that are close to weight, but the guys that have a bit to lose because the weight divisions are very big, like in MMA. Yeah, the guys that are at the upper end and had. A, a long way to go down. It is very, very hard on them. Very hard. Um, Tyler on his Tyler on his first go, cut weight, failed. Hydrated himself again, cut weight, failed, and then had to do it again on the day of the fight. Yeah, that's hard. Hydrate, cut weight, weigh in, and that's that. That took a while to get it to get past yeah very very difficult and the guys are at the upper end of the weight divisions so like even like say for george who was down at 70 kilos which i don't want him to do anymore mm. his next weight division up is 77 kilos it's a massive gap hey the massive gap so um and you know even for tyler who fights at uh welterweight 66.667 which already involved weight cutting for one championship at 65, 65.9. So yeah. he had to do, do that extra and pass hydration for the next division up for him is 70, which is, uh, which is big. So it's, yeah, it makes things very challenging. Yeah. Cause I guess you consider like for, for Tyler to not make that cut to, um, 65.8, his option is 70, which is where George fights. And George is way yeah. bigger than Tyler. So, like, just for perspective. So. Yeah, that's very big, very big boys in the 70. Yeah, I know. It's yeah. very big boys in the 70 kilo division. And then even, like, say, if George, George goes up to 77 kilos next time, he's going to have guys that are, you know, coming down from probably high 80s, mid-80s, yeah. stuff like that, to be that 77. So, Yeah. Yeah, always interesting to me, like, you know, people talk about trying to fix weight cutting, like one championship have to, to make it safer. Would you not just, like, I feel like the easiest way to fix weight cutting is, in, in that sense, have more weight options, right? Because like, people won't have to cut as much weight if you can, like, like the, the divisions that we're used to, 
in more conventional shows. You've got your 70, 72.5, your 76, your 79. When you're making guys go 7, 70, yeah. 77, 84, they kind of have to cut lap. You're not really giving them a choice. You yeah. make it harder yeah. with the high pressure. Yeah, definitely. You know, or even even catch weights, agreed weights between some yeah. guys can fight between weight divisions and stuff like that, um, which can make it, you know, one person might be coming up a little bit, one person might be coming down a little bit, or it's just agreed that it's at 66. But like even our uh, WA Sports, uh, Combat Sports Commission to help with the, help with the, the weight cutting issue over here, you know, they're from, from this year, they're making it that, okay, you've got to be in the weight division but I don't really feel that that helps it. it yeah. Help it at all. Yeah, that, that so, doesn't really do a whole lot, actually. <laughs> no. 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 Not at all. All right. People still, people still agree to weights anyway, but be in the yeah. weight division. <laughs> Whatever. Just like, just make good fight happen. Yeah. You know, really. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. All right, so oh, look, approaching the end of the time here, mate. Um, look, it, it's been awesome, great talk, man. and we really appreciate you for coming. Like, you know, friend about up a bit of your time to come talk to us as well. <laughs> yeah, Shane, Hugh, thank you for, uh, for making the time, inviting me on. It's awesome. Thank you. That's all right. I, I see my little talks enough. Yeah, we'd would love to chat to you again. <laughs> could could pick your brain for hours. <laughs> all right, thank you. So, um, thanks for. Just for our listeners from there, um, just quickly just say like where they can find your gym, Instagram and Facebook or what's yeah, that you- uh, Riddler's Gym on Instagram and, and Facebook. Um, check us out. Uh, that can lead you to our, our website as well, also Riddler's Gym. So wow. Main Street in Osborne Park, Perth. <laughs> Get down there if you're in WA. Yeah. Cool. All right, guys. So, like, so I'm, I'm just, just going to play the intro there, Darren. If you can hang around yep. after the intro for a little bit from there, that'd be awesome. Okay. No worries. Yeah. Awesome. But everyone else, we'll catch you next time. See ya. Peace.